again in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. It reads, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you have yet to do in our lives. Lord God, I pray that you minister to the hearts of each and every one of us here and those watching online. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. And the saving power through the shed Son of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we are saved. We praise you for you are holy and righteous, and we praise you for you are God. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. 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 This is part three on the Sermon on the Mount series. I have entitled this sermon, The Heart of the Matter. There are many things to like and to love about this sermon that begins, the Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. There are many things to name. One of the things that I love about it is that the takeaway you can get throughout all of it, if this is the only thing you take away, that being a Christian is far more than the surface level. It's deeper than skin deep. It's deeper than muscle deep. Bone deep. It speaks to the heart. Before we dig deep into today's scriptures and the sermon, I want to share something with you that I found. These are not my words. This is a quote from another pastor. Quote, In an edition of SBC Life, Charles Lowry shared the story of the old man with the yellow dog. An arrogant young man challenged the older man's dog to a dog fight. My dog will whip your dog, said the young man. The older gentleman politely refused the challenge, saying it would not be safe or right for the dog to fight. But the young man gave an order for his dog to attack the old man's mangy yellow dog. When the dust settled and the arrogant young man's dog was soundly defeated. He asked what kind of mangy yellow dog just whipped his prize fighting dog. The old man said, before I cut off his tail and painted him yellow, my dog was an alligator. <laughs> I got that from a pastor, Steve Andrews. Like this joke, we must look deeper within ourselves, within others, and often the scriptures themselves, to see the truth. We must peel away the mask we have built around our hearts, challenge others to do the same. And I, I want you to... to just take this last bit, this last thing I'm going to say here to finish this sentence. It's not enough just to read the Word of God. Yes, we read it. Yes, read it every day. But to study intently the Word of God. It's not a surface level faith. It's not a surface level walk we have with our Savior. It's deep. Past the skin, past the muscle, past the bone into your very heart. 
And we see this in the words of Christ. We see this throughout in every work of the New Testament. It's not just what you say or what you do. It's the intent of your heart. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, makes this abundantly clear in the Sermon on the Mount. Children resemble their parents. Just as children of God resemble their Heavenly Father. Jesus here is commanding that we exhibit moral perfection. When He says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, what does that mean? Is it even possible for fallen man to be morally perfect? I'm not perfect. My mama sometimes tells me I am, but I know I'm not. I make mistakes all the time. I'm not perfect. There's a difference between being perfect and being morally perfect. What does it mean to be morally perfect? Now, if you've been paying attention, you might be on track. You might be. I hope you are. Stay with me. I'm preaching. Stay with me. Scripture tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. Yet Jesus is telling us to be morally perfect. I tell you that your righteousness does not save you. Yet it reveals the evidence of that salvation. The close connection between this verse and Christ's teaching on love shows us that it is Unconditional love, that is the most crucial expression of God's character that shines through in the lives of true believers. It is the selfless heart that makes all the difference whether one is morally perfect or not. Not some <laughs> list of do's and don'ts. One of the things I love about the Sermon on the Mount is how Jesus speaks to the heart of righteousness, the motivation, the desire, the truth, how He shows us what true righteousness is. Genuine righteousness, not fake nice. In this sermon, we will explore three biblical teachings of Christ from Matthew chapter 6. Verses 1 through 18. Here Jesus once again peels back the surface layer of the religious practices of His day to expose the hypocrisy of the religious leaders at that time while showing us what having a true heart for God is. I want to take us back just a little bit. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, it reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were 
before you. The reason I just read the Beatitudes once more. I preached this in part one. The reason I preached it, be, I read just read it just now, was because I want it to be fresh in your mind. The Beatitudes are the foundation in which the entire Sermon on the Mount is built upon. You will see them reflected here in the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Charity is misunderstood by many as it entails more than the act of giving itself. To be real charity, it must come from a genuine selfless love for others. Charity does not seek praise nor recognition from man. Prayer is one of the most important aspects of our life as Christians. This too is sadly misunderstood and misapplied by more Christians than many might suspect. We will likewise discuss fasting. In my experience, too few Christians actually fast despite the power we find in it. Once again, I ask you, as I have in the last two sermons, and I will continue to ask this as we go forward through this series, to look into that mirror. The mirror where your face, your, your physical reflection is not present, but instead is the content of your heart reflected back to you. I want you to test yourself. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it reads, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. In verse 1, Jesus warns that the motivation for almsgiving is the most important. Alms is defined as charity to the poor. If one's motivation is praise from men, then that is rooted in self-love and is not charity. True charity is selfless. In verse 2, Jesus is telling us not to seek recognition but rather to do so in a way that does not draw attention to oneself. The instruction in verse 3 prohibits one from celebrating their own acts of righteousness. We should give to those in need, yet we should never draw attention to the fact that we do give, nor should we dwell on it. There is this huge misconception here in America. I, I tell you, no, no other people on the planet is as charitable as, as Americans. Give this is a land of plenty that gives a plenty away. There are many who, 
God bless them. They see those in our own community that are suffering, that are, are, are not just poor but destitute, yet they fear that by if they were to give them $2 or $5 or $10, that that money might go to other means to support a habit. So they don't give. They then feel more comfortable, say, writing a check to a charity and let, and let them do it. But what they're missing is that personal interaction through that charitable act. Charity is more than writing a check. You help someone, but it isn't necessarily charity. Paul even talks about this when Paul says, if I gave all to the poor, but had not love, it isn't charity. Charity is more than just giving. There are many who, wealthy men, and women in this country that they're known as philanthropists. And they're recognized publicly with awards and, and with big halls with their names on them. But the truth is, they're only a philanthropist, so on and so called. They're only giving this amount of money because of the tax breaks they get. That isn't charity. It's giving, but it isn't charity. I speak now to each of us individually. None of us here are one of those super wealthy CEOs or executives that would be in that situation. Yet, day in and day out, we pass those in our life who are destitute every day in this community. They may be down on their luck. They may have an addiction that they struggle with. There could be mental illness of some kind. There was a time for two years in my youth, I myself was homeless. Two years. The problem that many that are homeless feel is that they're invisible. They're treated less than human, beneath contempt by many. Just ignored. They want them to go away instead of compact with compassion and empathy trying to help them. And they don't all have the same needs. I'll tell you that one of the biggest things you can give someone who's homeless for Christmas as a Christmas present is new socks. Socks don't last long when you wear the same pair every day. And when it's cold, you need new socks. But it is that personal interaction Treating them like a human being, like a brother and a sister, that means far more to them than that pair of socks. Show some compassion. So show some empathy. Give what you can give. But it is truly that, that expression of love that makes the biggest difference. It did for me. And it did for all those that I know. When I myself, after no longer being homeless, worked with the homeless to give back. There are some that would say that a, a nation, a society is judged by how they treat their less fortunate. In Matthew 
chapter 6, verse 5 through 8, it reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. We see again in verse 5, Jesus calling out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. These religious leaders would pray publicly, not for the sake of God, but rather for the sake of men, so they could see their supposed piety. It was a show put on for men. Not at all was it a cry to God. In verse 6, Jesus is telling us that genuine prayer does not require a human audience. The Greek word translated in the closet is Timaean, meaning inner chamber, which was a room with no windows affording the believer privacy while they prayed. Privacy. You see the contrast here. Throughout this, this entire chapter, in fact, in, throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, you see the contrasts laid out by Christ. I will speak on this a bit further on. Jesus describes the Father as the one who is in secret. We can encounter God through prayer anywhere. Even. We can encounter God even in the most obscure locations. The vain repetition spoken of in verse 7 is referring to the pagan practices of that day of reciting meaningless gibberish or repeating the same phrases over and over again. Our prayers should be purposeful. Purposefully should we pray. The time we spend in prayer each day is important. At no time will anyone ever hear me say, you're praying too much. I'll say you're not, you're never praying enough. Pray an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, an hour at noon time. Pray. As much time as you have to pray, pray. As the Spirit moves upon your heart, Pray. But I tell you that the way in which we pray has far more significance. Constant repetition avails us nothing. God hears our prayers, knows the desire of our hearts. And beginning in verse 9, Jesus shows us how to pray. Beginning in verse 9, it reads, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a powerful prayer. There is so much information here. The Lord's Prayer can be prayed as it is written, and many do. Many, many people pray the Lord's Prayer as written. There's nothing wrong with it. Though I tell you Christ's intent was not to show us what to pray, but how to pray. The Lord's Prayer begins with praise, followed by calling for God's will to be done. God is not a divine ATM machine in the sky waiting to fulfill your every desire, to lay in your lap every luxury you want, to bring the, the, the specific person that you love more than anything. That may not be who God wants you to love. That may not be the person God intends for you to marry. I, now, I can't speak for anybody else, but I've loved the wrong people before. I think we all have. Sometime in the moment, you may think, this person, if she would just love me back, my life would be perfect. No, it wouldn't. If God meant for that person to love you, they'd love you. You may say, well, God, if I just had this job, this perfect job, oh, it's just the perfect job for me. That may not be where God wants you. And you know, when God's plan for you begins to unfold, in His perfect timing, and it's perfect every time, it always turns out better than you could have hoped for. Sometimes, there's an old country song, sometimes, how did that go? Sometimes God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Sometimes, just sometimes. God does bless us, and yes, He does answer our prayers. He does so in accordance with His divine will in His perfect time. Next, Jesus shows us to pray for the supply of our needs when he says, give us this day our daily bread. I want you to note these two facts. One, daily bread is not a want, nor some luxury we think we need, but rather the daily sustenance we need to survive. Isaiah 58 can be summed up this way. Where God guides, He provides. And two, the Romans provided bread daily to the poor. This would then have resonated to the Jews of that day. That believers should rely on God for our needs, not the government. Too many people today disregard God and His provisions for our lives, and instead rely upon the world. Next, Jesus shows us that we should repent daily, asking God for forgiveness, and that we should equally forgive others who wrong us. The disobedience of our sins is an affront to God, yet He forgives all who believe on Jesus. And will test us, yet he will never lead us into temptation. <laughs> yes, when we come to him in genuine repentance, we too should forgive those that have wronged us. The deliverance from evil is the deliverance from our sin. The Lord's prayer then ends in praise. When you have a heart 
of praise to God. Ceasing to selfishly pray for your own will and instead begin to pray for God's will. When you begin to rely upon God instead of the world, when you have a continually humble and repentant heart seeking forgiveness and forgiving others, when you learn to flee from temptation, trusting that God will give you the strength and discernment to overcome temptation and sin, you will immediately notice a change in your prayer life, in your relationships, and in your walk with God. Verses 14 and 15 reads, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Here Jesus is telling us that we must forgive others to be forgiven by God. For some, this may be a difficult, if not seemingly impossible task at times. If we have been so profoundly harmed or wounded by another, particularly if that wounding continues, it can be difficult, if not nearly impossible, to forgive. Yet we should try. Learn to forgive and to forgive freely. If we cannot forgive others, then we do not reflect our Heavenly Father. We do not have a heart for God if we just lack the ability to forgive. And there are some who do. They have no interest in forgiving others. Lacking a forgiving heart in ourselves and in others should then be seen as what? Spiritual immaturity at best? or the absence of the evidence of their salvation at worst. Be weary of those who claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ if they lack a forgiving heart, absent mercy and grace towards others for even the slightest of offenses. Instruct them in the truth of God's grace with love, with love, as it should be seen reflected in ourselves and pray for them always. <clears throat> in verses 16 through 18 it reads, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Here Jesus addresses fasting, telling us that it is that it profits us nothing to publicly display to the world that we are fasting, as the hypocritical Pharisees of that day would do. The Jewish practice was to smear ashes upon their face, that thou appear, and they would show a somber and pained expression in public, an anguish. They would project this, this feeling of anguish. How they are suffering so much through their fasts. They fasted not for God, but rather to be seen by men as pious. At this point, you have noticed that in each topic covered today, Jesus condemns the selfish public displays of the disingenuous, and morally bankrupt religious leaders of his day as a warning to us all, and he then speaks to the heart of the matter. Our charity must be selfless 
seeking no personal profit or recognition. Our prayers are not meant for man, but rather for God. Our fasting is a means to grow spiritually, not to show the world how righteous and pious we are. Here we see the selfish contrasted with the selfless. Here we see fake devotion contrasted with a true heart for God. Give freely to those in need. Pray fervently and selflessly to God. Forgive freely and often without prejudice. Fast so that you may grow spiritually as you walk ever closer with Him. When I began this sermon, I said that as a Christian, our faith is it's, it's more than skin deep. It's more than just the surface. It's not just what you say and what you do. It's not about being nice. It's about being new. It's about loving selflessly, forgiving freely. Jesus is telling us not to be a surface level Christian. A surface level Christian projects false piety and false righteousness. Because see, it is the intent of your heart that matters. The intent. The motivation behind it all. What is in your heart? Are you, are you giving alms to the poor? Charity? Out of a sense of selfless love? Or because you want people to see you doing it? Are you praying these big prayers in public? Or do you truly, truly desire to, to speak with God, to hear from God, to lay your burdens down at the feet of the cross, to give it to God? Do you fast privately, seeking to have a closer walk with Him, to be stronger spiritually, to fast for... To, for the power of God to come down into your life or your family or your church? Are you fasting so that people know you're fasting and they think you're holy and righteous and pious? I invite you to turn to God laying your burdens down at the cross of Jesus Christ if you have yet to do so. If you have yet to accept Him as your Lord and Savior, I tell you, this, this is a free gift. The free gift of God's grace. Offered to all who would receive it. They to accept it. This free gift of salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins on Calvary 2,000 years ago. If you looked into that mirror where your heart was laid bare and it has been weighed and found wanting, I invite you to seek God in prayer. If you feel led to rededicate yourself to God, I invite you to pray right now. Do not let this moment pass you by. Tomorrow is never promised. God loves you more than you could possibly comprehend. He wants to be reconciled to you this day. Do not turn Him away. He wants to use you to minister to others, to touch the hearts of others. So I invite you to seek Him in prayer now and always. Yes, God loves you. And let us be more than surface level Christians. And that is the heart of the matter.
Me.